Okay, welcome back. Uh, up next is Carlo da Fara with Disaster Recovery with Open Nebula. So, good morning. Thank you very much for uh, being here. Uh, as you can see from the uh, beautiful and uh, uh, tranquil and relaxing scene behind, I will be talking about uh, uh, what to do when you, let's say, uh, are asked to prepare for a disaster or what you can do to, let's say, prevent the, best, the worst uh, of what a disaster can do to your infrastructure. The, uh, let's imagine that you are the system administrator that comes mor Monday morning and discover that something is not working. The first solution of an engineer is, of course, getting some coffee. The second thing is uh, learning a little bit more about what is a disaster and what to do to prevent it. So, it's very easy to see and to understand when you're facing a disaster. This is a disaster, for example. This is a disaster. <laughs> this was a disaster. <laughs> there are these people that see cries a lot when you're facing this kind of thing. To understand what's a disaster, it's very easy. It's that thing that makes you want some coffee. And uh, disaster recovery is a very, very, uh, let's say, vague term, like a cloud or whatever, that basically tries to convey an idea that you cannot prevent a disaster, because uh, disasters are by definition something that cannot be prevented, it can be ameliorated. But the point is that disaster recovery helps you in uh, uh, at least uh, put some of your IT system uh, back in, uh, in, ter in, um, in order to provide uh, the services that are considered to be vital. It's not uh, actually, it does not actually mean to recreate the same thing that was before. Usually you, get, you create a, a smaller thing, sometimes you create a slightly different thing. Uh, in some cases, it's just a web page that say, uh, I'm sorry, we got hacked uh, and we lost all your credit card data, but come back later and we will sell you something else or some, something like this. Uh, disaster recovery focuses on IT or technology system supporting critical business functions. We will see later that some of this uh, uh, provides uh, uh, us uh, guidance on how to do things better. Uh, why we talk about disaster recovery? Uh, because the majority of companies that face a disaster never recovers. Because they don't have disaster recovery. 80% of businesses affected by a major incident never reopen or close within 18 months. Uh, this is a, a very interesting statistic just from two years ago from XA, which is one uh, of the largest insurance groups. And it's uh, one of the reasons why, if you have a very good disaster recovery in place, you can usually even ask your insurance to lower their prices because you are less a risk for them, which is a very good, uh, let's say, business incentive to do so. Uh, we managed to recover from our disaster with uh, just a few billion dollars lost in revenues. Uh, the biggest problem of uh, disaster recovery is uh, that most of disasters are caused by humans. Not in, this in the, let's say, natural sense, uh, like they are building where they are not, or they are destroying the, the earth or, so or whatever. But the fact that the majority of incidents are caused by humans, in the, in the sense that they are caused by human error. In 2010, it was estimated that 40% of all data losses were ca caused by human error, both software and uh, 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 practical human uh, commands given in the wrong moment. Uh, uh, earlier in, the, uh, in 2005, it was uh, estimated as something like uh, 80%. This is a slide that I really like. It, it comes from a few weeks ago. It's uh, the, the, the presentation that uh, one of CERN people gave at OpenStack. And it shows uh, what is uh, 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 the example of human error. 
you get uh, in the circle, in the red circle there, finger trouble led to loss of 246 images. That's something like 20% uh, of their data lost because of a finger trouble, which means that basically, oops, I, I deleted it and I emptied the, the, the trash. Uh, they restored 44. Just imagine, this is CERN, so they basically recreated everything from scratch and whatever. But imagine your bank that calls you and say, I'm very sorry, due to a finger trouble, we deleted your bank account. <laughs> there is a 5% probability we restore it, maybe. Then you have other situations, like, for example, the emergency power off which is something that is uh, uh, um, in many countries, it's obligatory to have. It's uh, a global switch that kills off power to allow for firefighters to enter an office and make sure that they can use whatever is necessary in terms of uh, um, chemical products or, sc or uh, sprays and so on, uh, without having to worry uh, about uh, electrical power present inside. It's especially used for, uh, for uh, power plants and so on. And you get uh, those uh, wonderful examples of uh, optimal positioning, like this one. When you open too much, you basically shut off everything. <laughs> or the other one, when you have the, the fire button just on the side of the emergency power off. They had to put a post-it that say, don't touch. You know one thing about post-it is that the glue inside of the post-its exposed to air lasts a few days. So after a few days, you see the post-it goes down. And the next time someone say, oh, there is a fire, let's shut everything down. Uh, in fact, 26% of human errors uh, in uh, medium to large data centers were actually caused by people that did the wrong thing. And uh, my best example is the paper delivery person in the last line. The, uh, this guy uh, was sent uh, with uh, a, a very big pallet of paper and they basically, th he, he thought that the red button was used to open the doors and he opened the doors, the, uh, the power got shut down, everyone was in the dark and say, well, now you don't have your computers anymore, you have the paper and the pens to work again. So, if uh, disaster recovery is so important, from the point of view of the system administrator that is using, um, let's say, not in li unlimited funds uh, and does not have an unlimited amount of time and money to save things because that will be very easy to do. Uh, the first thing that you have to do is define the problem. Not every disaster recovery uh, infrastructure is the same. Actually, they are, never th they are always different, especially because uh, when you want to recover something, uh, you have to recover it at a specific point of time. So you have two parameters that basically define all the requirements that you will have later on in your, let's say, project. The first one is the recovery time objective. Uh, th th there's a very long description of what is it, but basically is, I want my company back in 10 minutes. You usually get a call from someone very important say, I don't know, someone shot that big red button, not me, but I want my ERP system to be online in now. Uh, now usually is a, is a, um, uh, let's say, uh, is a term that can be substituted for 10 seconds, one minute, one hour, one day. Uh, there are companies where the, the server or the computer there is used just to project the night blue lighting and is basically no more effective than a lamp. So even if it doesn't work for a day, say, oh, I don't have my lamp, but it's not very important. The recovery time objective is two or three days. There are companies where the, if the ERP stops, it's a real problem and they want it back in the minimum amount of time that's compatible with economics, which means a few minutes. There are companies or groups where the recovery time objective is zero. We have as a customer the civil protection agency of my region. They handle all the emergency 
and all the signals from a set of, uh, um, let's say, um, systems that are uh, used to help in case of earthquake, floods and so on, if it stops, is a real problem. That is, it someone may die in that one hour. So the recovery time objective is the minimum possible. It's never zero, but it may be shorter uh, as, as short as possible. The other one is the recovery point objective, which is a widely different thing. It's uh, how much data can you uh, afford to lose at the restart moment, that is when you reach the recovery time objective. It doesn't mean that it's lost forever. It means that it's lost in the period up to the RTO. So, for example, you have constant snapshots and you uh, have the snapshots outside and uh, basically every night uh, you get a snapshot of your mail server you lose everything inside of your main building and you are recovering from snapshot, then your recovery point objective is 24 hour maximum because it's the time between one midnight and the other. It's of course probably smaller because it happens, uh, let's say at eight in the morning, you're losing everything from midnight to eight in the morning. But in general, it's the maximum tolerable period for, for which data might be lost because sometimes you recover from, from your server that is navigating um, on the water or from the hard disk that is hidden by uh, acid, like uh, one of my friends had uh, uh, it happened, or something like that. You may recover something, but the point is that when you ended your recovery, how much data you have lost. You are willing to lose or you're able to lose. One of the reasons why many companies or many organizations are not using disaster recovery is that the majority are tuned for very large groups uh, and tend to be oriented toward pay by the terabyte protected. So, a small company nowadays has tens, in, uh, in the ten of terabytes of data inside of their companies, you are talking about $100,000 of uh, software, hardware, services, consulting, whatever. So you're talking a budget that is usually unavailable for the majority of them. But it's something that can be done and uh, it can be done quite easily thanks to some of the properties of Open Nebula we'll talk later. Uh, there are a few simple rules to start thinking about making a disaster recovery infrastructure, which is not a plan. A plan is one of those things that uh, uh, usually very large companies do have a disaster recovery plan. Uh, it's something that they paid a lot of money for, uh, specialized consultants, a very big black book that say, open this in case of disaster. Something like 500 pages and say, if there's a fire, there's one lucky guy that's the DR manager that has to take it, open it, and while everyone flee the building, is say, now open this one and say, let's call the manager, is there a fire in the building? Yes. Then try to see if there's someone else there and so on. The DR manager usually is the, is the first that, that, that has, uh, let's say, problem in, keeping be, uh, in being kept alive in this situation. The first rule is never put everything in a single basket. It may be uh, let's say, common sense. But it seems to be the first rule that is never applied. This is one of my best examples. Uh, there's a company uh, that managed uh, uh, sewers code uh, um, in uh, helping in things like uh, auditing and so on. Uh, they were uh, exceptional. They were website, the website said we are totally back it up, we have 100% reliability, 99.99999 and lots of other nines and so on, and they were lost in one day. Why? Because they had everything on Amazon, someone stole their credential and basically erased everything. Because their backups, their snapshot, their everything, were in Amazon under the same name. So, when you delete everything, yes, the company was no more. <laughs> A 
And, uh, and someone said, well, that's a nice way to put it. This happens to me. I received a call in the middle of the night. Um, a customer decided to buy uh, a disaster recovery solution from a local data center. It was uh, sent, uh, uh, they, they sent him a wonderful brochure uh, with lots of images of safes and uh, heavens and things like that. And uh, they basically bought everything from them. Disaster recovery, snapshot, backups and so on. And they lost everything because uh, the, the data center had everything in a very, very large and extremely costly box. And someone decided to upgrade the uh, storage array network firmware for this box without reading in the, in the instruction, in the release notes uh, for the update, that the update was destructive. And so they wiped out 196 terabytes of user data, including every backups, every snapshot, everything that was held inside of the storage array network. And uh, the nice thing is that the email that sent was sent to the customer explaining this little problem. In the bottom has something like, uh, we hope uh, to, to help you in uh, realize your um, technical and uh, whatever. And so we are proud ISO certified, DS certified, A, B, G, D. They had lots of certification. And in no way, in none of this certification, it was written that you cannot put every snapshot and backup in a single place. You imagine the situation, it's 10 p.m. in the evening and you have the customer that probably because of the shock say, <laughs> I lost everything. <laughs> Can you do something? <laughs> the first thing is never put everything inside in a single box. The second thing is never trust a single software and insulate one with the other. In uh, electronics, there is a, a component that's a, a wonderful idea. It's uh, called a photocoupler. It's actually a, a, a very small chip. Inside, there is a, a light emitting diode on one side and a receiver on the other. And the two pieces don't touch inside. There is no silico silicon there. This means that whatever current is going on in the first uh, two step in the first two contacts never reach the other and this is an important principle in disaster recovery as well because apart from human error there is another very huge cause of disaster which is software software upgrades software changes configurations all of them can destroy both sides and so it's important, if you want to have something that survives you, to have some way to insulate one with the other. And uh, to have more than one way to prevent disaster. This is a, um, a wonderful example of uh, uh, ingenious engineering. Uh, this, uh, this is a nuclear reactor. It's more or less like uh, your computer. Uh, there is one part, which is this one, the freeze plugs. It's something that is actually quite brilliant. There is a, a block of ice that's constantly cooled. If the ice uh, melts because there is no power at all available, not even emergency power, the, uh, the ice uh, uh, block melts and provides a discharge for the, the molten liquid on top. So basically, it tried to, to have something that works even if there is nothing else that works. Disaster recovery needs to be done in a way similar to this. There must be, let's say, an emergency escape, let's put it this way, that can at least freeze everything 
before it may further damage. Uh, we will see later what, what do we mean with it. Rule two, you don't have to apply the same recovery time objective and recovery point objective for every VM. It's, first of all, useless. It's totally a waste of resources and it prevents usually you from making a real disaster recovery. The point is that Let's say that you are this poor customer. This is a, a, a schema of the set of IT services of uh, public administrations. You have hundreds of components. Not all of them are critical and not all of them do have the same recovery point objective. So trying to do everything at once is trying to say that all of these containers are the same and I need to bring them exactly in the same time. That's not true. There may be one that needs to be absolutely saved because there is everything important in there. And there are other, if, there, there are, if the, I don't care if there one of these is, uh, is lost because maybe there is uh, an ISO of uh, something, it was an experiment, I don't know. But the real point is that you need to make an inventory of what you have. And that's a very important thing because you will discover that only 10% of your VMs are really critical, usually, and are those that where the recovery time objective is shorter. The majority of them can be recreated from other sources. In fact, uh, NASA does have a, a, a group of software classes from A to F, I think, and uh, uh, there is the, the class A, where there are humans, and uh, I a failure may mean that uh, the, the human may die. Those need to be preserved, and the recovery time objective for them is zero. Because you basically, you cannot afford to lose anything in that case. But there are other situations, like for example this one, this is the, the full software classes, general purpose desktop software. I lost my Microsoft Office. Oh, I feel better, actually. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's important to recognize that you are not saving everything inside of the company. You are saving just uh, the critical part of it. Rule three, design a reliable oracle. This is the other important thing in your disaster recovery. When do you call a disaster? It's not that easy to see that, for example, nothing here works. Maybe something works and something's not. Uh, if you remember the, the image where the submerged servers, maybe half of the servers that are on top were already working. Maybe some of the servers down there that were learning to swim were able to do something as well. But the point is that you have to design an oracle, which is not this one, because it will pay a lot of money just to be the name, but this one. The oracle is a combination of, usually, software, services, and a human that decides when it's necessary to initiate a disaster recovery procedure. This is one of the most difficult part. If your company is simple, it's simple. I have 10 VMs, two of them are critical. If I am unable to reach in any way, and this means more than one way to reach them, these machines, and I know that it's uh, too late for start something else, then we start a disaster recovery. Usually there's a, uh, an initial part. The Oracle is a, an application that warns you by SMS and say, well, th it seems that there is some pr problem in your premises and sends you a photo of a fire or something like this. And you say, OK, initiate a disaster recovery. But it's difficult. This is, uh, mm, uh, if you know systems theory, uh, observing the state of a system and estimating its states is as complex as the system you are estimating. So it's. Uh, how the others do it? This is uh, um, uh, the, the majority of companies selling disaster re recovery services are doing it on uh, external clouds. 
And this means that they do have lots of levels because they don't want you to pay for having the VMs running all time. Let's imagine that you have 100 VMs on one side. You will have to have 100 VMs on Amazon side as well, including all their storage and whatever, running in real time. That's why you have uh, uh, Pilot Light fully working, low capacity and multi-site and so on, which is a huge problem because basically you start to have to count how much you're paying Amazon for disaster recovery and the company that does the re disaster recovery and so on. It's much easier to do uh, uh, those kind of things with Open Nebula, of course, or they not would have invited me here. <laughs> with just one warning, this works quite well for us and for some of our customers. It needs to be adapted to your customers or your needs. So uh, we will I will try to give you uh, a few words of how to, let's say, adapt it to uh, more than one situation later. We use uh, a combination of two things. The first one is uh, Open Nebula because it's beautiful. And the second one is uh, a distributed file system that's called uh, LizardFS, which is a fork of MooseFS. They are basically the same thing. It's uh, uh, a distributed file system that is uh, uh, based on a, mm, on a few peculiar capacity. The first one is that snapshots are uh, basically instantaneous. They, they don't uh, take space and they are uh, always thin provisioning, uh, provisioned. And uh, uh, it's based on uh, chunks. Every file is divided into chunks. And these chunks can be sent basically everywhere. So. Uh, this part, how uh, LizardFS and MooseFS creates a snapshot, is basically by, prepare by having a tree with the full metadata on uh, always in, um, in RAM. And whenever you create a snapshot, you are basically just replicating that metadata. So it's instantaneous and it doesn't take space. If you modify the source or the snapshot, it creates a new chunk and simply rearrange the uh, metadata to point to the new one. Chunks are uh, counted and numbered. So uh, um, let's say that, for example, you don't need uh, file one anymore. The metadata will be destroyed. And uh, in this case, for example, the chunk uh, in, the, in the end will be deleted because it's not uh, referenced anymore by anyone. It's very efficient. Uh, snapshots are read-write and basically are exactly like files. It's impossible to distinguish a file from a snapshot, which uh, uh, is a property that we use for doing the duplication, which is uh, something that helps you uh, in, uh, when you have many snapshots. The other interesting feature of uh, uh, LizardFS is the fact that uh, write are performed through a set of chunk servers that in, in our case we place exactly on top of the same machine where we run the virtualization with the KVM and Open Nebula. Uh, uh, chunks uh, do have one uh, important feature which is a tag that's called a goal. Usually the goal is very simple. Uh, for example, goal tree means uh, make sure that there are, there are at least uh, three copies of this chunk. When you write the first one, immediately the other chunk server propagate the, the, the fact and say, I need to have other two copies. So they ask for other chunk server to get a copy and so on. Up they reach the original goal. Uh, if uh, one node dies, each chunk server recognize that there are chunks that are under goal because those chunks are not available anymore. And they try to find the space and place where to, to put another copy so they reach the goal again. Originally, the goal was simple and number, which is, let's say, good enough. But then they extended it with tiring and tags. So for example, you can say, I want to have three copies, one copy on SSD, where it will be used by the virtual machine, one copy here on this rotational disk and one copy remote site. So you can have geographical streaming. And you can have even more complex uh, situations. 
Uh, you can even have, let's say, things, uh, it's a, a little bit extreme for me, but for example, I want a copy on a Western digital disk, I want a copy on a Toshiba one, because I think that this one may fail faster or whatever. Uh, the, the important idea is that you can have uh, a concept of geographic affinity. So, what we do, uh, especially for public administration, that for example, in Italy, public administration are uh, required by law to have uh, a form of IT disaster recovery. The majority of disasters are local, first of all, because as we said, most disasters are used, uh, user driven and the user is usually a single stupid in a single room, so we can contain it in some way. Uh, other disasters tend to be local as well, especially UPS problem, electrical problem, fires, they tend to be concentrated in a region. So, for example, you have uh, a, a, um, a production plant, you have uh, uh, four or five Open Nebula nodes, everything from Open Nebula is stored inside of LizardFS, including the database, including the virtual machine, everything. So it gets replicated for free. Then you get two nodes on the other side of the building, and you basically stream everything there as well. Storage cost is very low. Uh, a two terabyte disk is $80, $90. So you can stuff lots of disks inside of a node just to have all the copies. Those copies are real time. So, uh, well, let's say that there is a one second delay, but you can basically assume that you are a recovery uh, point objective of one second. Because every change that is propagated is propagated to remote node as well. Then you have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, at least uh, an initial capability of recovering. Uh, in most situations it, suffi it suffice. In one of the municipalities where we installed this kind of thing, uh, m most municipalities are connected by fiber optic cables in, uh, in my country uh, and uh, uh, basically it's an internal network between them. So they have three nodes on one uh, building and they have two nodes uh, on, uh, in a school building where they have a small closet and they basically are streaming constantly. In this case, uh, what happens is uh, if the, uh, let's say, municipality data center shuts down, uh, we have a very simple failover mechanism and we start Open Nebula and everything else on the two remote nodes in the school. It starts lower, it starts only part of the services, but basically they, they perceive only the, um, the, the, the stop in the time where the VM are reinstantiated on the other side. Then you have the remote side. And for this, we use uh, one thing that I really love of Open Nebula, which are the data stores. We have created a few uh, custom data stores. Uh, the easiest one are this one, goal one, goal two, goal three, goal four. Basically, each uh, data store is a directory, and we ask LizardFS if something falls into the directory that's called goal three, replicate it three times. If it falls in goal four, replicate it four times. Uh, if it's something that I downloaded for the internet or in a, an ISO of uh, an operating system that I can re-download and so on, and I want to lose uh, space uh, for storing it, I can use Gold One. Then I have four special data stores. F they are marketed for disaster recovery. That's the air. The air 2L 2R means uh, two local copies here and two remote one. So. In the municipality and school example, I want two copies at least uh, in two nodes here and two copies in two nodes there. 2L1R means, uh, well, it's critical but not that much. Uh, it's uh, one copy remote suffice and two copies here. And then you have the snapshots one. Let's say that you want to make sure that some of these images are stored not in the building next to yours, because something may happen to both buildings. You want to have something outside as well. 
In this case, it's impossible usually uh, to have uh, uh, a real-time streaming of chunks. If you have 100 virtual machines, it will be uh, tens of gigabits just to, to bring out all the changes. It will be useless because, as I mentioned, we actually don't care to have a recovery time objective or zero for a machine that sits there and basically is a web server. It's useless. For those, we take advantage of another factor. We take advantage of the fact that a snapshot, unless we make changes, basically does not add any new chunk. So it's a form of the de duplication. It's very easy, the duplication. We make snapshot or snapshot, and we uh, replicate everything on the other side through uh, mm, sync queues. It works like this. Local means uh, here, where the disaster may strike. Remote is uh, some data center somewhere. Uh, we usually uh, take uh, mm, uh, offer of those uh, dedicated server offers uh, that are something like uh, 100 euros per month or whatever. So you have your dedicated node and uh, everything inside. On the local side, where the change happen, where there is a virtual machine that is changing those chunks, that is changing those sectors, we take a snapshot with the time that is uh, uh, indicated inside of the data store. So we have one hour snapshot, 12 hours snapshot, 24 hours snapshot, weekly snapshots, because things may not change uh, that fast. When you, on the other side, uh, apart from the first synchronization where everything is new, because uh, on, uh, on the remote side there was never any synchronization, so it's empty, we do the initial synchronization, then we take uh, snapshots of those snapshots. At this point you should say, okay, this, uh, this guy is, uh, uh, is an idiot because you are doing a snapshot of something that has not changed. Because here we don't have virtual machine, there's no one that is changing those things. Consider that this one and this one, for the uh, photocoupler uh, pattern, they are totally distinct installation. This is a lizard FS installation, this is a separate lizard FS installation. They talk only through AirSync. The point is, if I do an in-place AirSync of this, uh, I this uh, let's say, uh, directory structure, I'm actually creating a new chunk here, so I'm, uh, I'm taking up space only if the difference between uh, the previous day snapshot and this one does match a change in that side, which means that we are doing a very, very simple form of the duplication in the temporal sense. It works very well. In fact, uh, uh, remember that you must do an in-place AirSync because as we discovered the first time that we tried it, AirSync creates a new file and then moves over the file. So it creates every time it was creating new chunks and we weren't able to understand why. Uh, we got more coffee and after more coffee we understand that the, the secret is having it exactly in the same place. And you get a very nice, on uh, one uh, on a 1.8 terabyte set of uh, around 12 virtual machines, uh, reasonably used inside of a company, we got a 25%, uh, 25 times speed up. So it's fairly good and it means that it's capable of doing uh, a remote snapshot that is coherent because uh, uh, LizardFS snapshots are always coherent because they preserve temporality. And uh, we just uh, have to add, uh, as uh, uh, a little, let's say, uh, help for, especially for the Windows uh, on the Windows side, uh, mm, the support for VSS inside of this snapshotting process. Before taking a snapshot, you send to the guest that is inside of the Windows side the VSS message uh, freeze, so everything is uh, uh, that is uh, in cache is saved on the disk and then thaw when you have finished to do the snapshot. The snapshot is instantaneous. It, takes, it really takes something like a one millisecond. So it's basically not even perceptible for the majority of customer. This uh, means uh, that even on a very, let's say, uh, normal internet connectivity, you are able to do 
remotization, full remotization of the entire structure of your company outside, which means that if something happens, you have a full open nebula ready to start on the other side. The other aspect is uh, estimating um, uh, data consumption. Uh, we are not interested in reading. We are all interested in writing because wha we, what we are interested in and what changes the state of the data store. Because that's the only thing that we need to, to replicate on the other side. Uh, in most situations, it's possible to, to see that actual read, uh, actual write uh, to the data store uh, average for in, a, in a day tend to be not that, uh, let's say, incredible. Uh, and uh, if you need to have specific information, and that's one thing that we would love to have added in the next version of Open Nebula, is to see how much uh, operation, uh, write operation a VM has done, which is very simple to do. You just enter into VRSEC and you send uh, DOM BLK stat and you get the uh, basically how many writes have been done on that disk. It's used uh, just as an estimation you don't need to have a, a precise number, just have an idea. Uh, how many megabits per second do I need to perform a snapshot every hour of this VM that writes this, this amount of data there? So you basically have uh, an estimate, you try it, and you, you try to take a, 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 a good, uh, let's say, percentage of advantage just to, to make sure that it works uh, every time. This way, it's possible to design a DR scheme that works uh, on each DSL line, on, uh, even on a DSL line if you, don't, you are not too, uh, working too much on those uh, uh, R disks. Uh, there are a few things that need to be done on Windows. Go figure. For example, you have to disable uh, the automatic defragmentation. Defragmentation changes every sector on the disk. So the poor uh, lizard FS uh, basically thinks that you're formatting everything and has to send lots and lots of write requests on the other side. It's very easy to do. The other th easy thing to do would be not to use Windows, but mm, that's... Uh we have a variation of the pilot light method. On the remote side, we have two nodes. So if one fails, the other uh, is uh, ready to start work. Uh, it's a running open nebula with uh, uh, lizard FS and so on, uh, which is essential because you will not get snapshots or differentials or whatever. Uh, and two VMs, the Oracle and the tester. The Oracle is actually a very simple uh, network monitoring server. Uh, you can use whatever you like uh, and basically sends you a message that say, something is happening, maybe it's a disaster. The tester is a very simple machine that uh, tries uh, to verify that what you have on your side is actionable, which is the other side of disaster recovery. You copy everything, but you must be sure that what you have copied actually makes sense, which reminds me I, I got a call one, uh, one evening from a company that lost basically everything because they thought that backups were for, mm, not for important people. And they discovered that they had a, 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 a network tape unit and say, oh, I'm sure that there's a, a tape inside, so maybe some backup has been done. But actually the poor guys had the, uh, the n n tape cleaning unit inside for seven years, I think. So I did they had the cleanest uh, unit in the world, but not a single data. <laughs> so you have to understand that what has been uh, copied needs to be able to be restored. The tester is very simple. Takes a snapshot of your current snapshot, since it's no more space for you. Creates a, a, a separate network and just starts the VM inside and performs simple tests like to check if there is RDP on the Windows machine, if HTTP is working, and so on. Tests that can be used uh, even without external network connectivity, because th this network is not going anywhere. It performs the test and says, OK, this backup is working. Then destroys everything. You don't need it. 
You just uh, need the, the, the message that tells you that if, uh, if it's there, it works. Uh, you need to install only uh, the critical VMs. If you have lots of VMs and you basically need to move everything because something really dramatic happened and you flooded everything and you don't have a server anymore and so on, uh, you go to a company that sells you servers, uh, the dedicated servers. Basically, in 30 minutes, they give you a server for a week for $49. You buy 10 of them, you auto-install auto um, the, the base operating system that is LizardFS and, uh, and uh, nothing much and no much else because OpenNebula is on the other two nodes. Uh, and you basically start everything there. This is important. You never start everything at once. Because usually you don't know how many workloads were in execution. Sometimes some of the workloads were not executing. You have VMs, but you don't need to start all of them. Usually it's, uh, this is a manual process. That is, you select, that for example, the ERP is a useful thing. Uh, the other things may not that, that important. Uh, there are lots of leader uh, um, um, small other things uh, uh, with some uh, let's say uh, effort you can create something like this this is a portable data center uh, that's it's very useful you can bring it like a, a, a trolley around it's uh, shockproof uh, it does have a small ups uh, on in the bottom it runs open nebula and does even have a, a wi-fi uh, router inside so you can basically say that if you don't want to have a remote site, you can have your along with you. Uh, sometimes uh, there are little things that may help a lot. Uh, some of my customers are industrial uh, plants and facilities where you have dust that flies around, you have uh, electric uh, current basically uh, everywhere, you have uh, um, uh, problems of static discharge and so on. There's a one small suggestion. You invest a little bit more in a rack that is designed for environment you are using. Uh, using a traditional uh, rack for networking device, for example, when you are near uh, a, 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 an industrial cutting machine that each time that it trunks uh, something generates a spike that resets everything, which is something that I happen to, to see personally. You see, everything stops down. And then everything starts and restarts things and say, we don't understand why we have to change servers every week. Carlo? Yep. Can you wrap it up? Yes, I will wrap up. So, uh, you can invest a little bit more in a better enclosure and you need substantially increase uh, the probability of your servers surviving. If you're living in a war zone, there are even server farms that are designed to live, uh, uh, they are boom proof, completely boom proof, they are very nice. Uh, and uh, just to wrap up the last uh, few slides, uh, uh, since I would love to, 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 to leave you with something more uh, to think about, uh, Never, never do disaster recovery in a total automated way. Sometimes you have a problem, you are firefighting here, for example, you have storage problem, networking problem, whatever, and uh, the disaster recovery system decides that you want to move your VMs on fire on somewhere else. So you are firefighting here, you know, you're keeping your VM here. Don't leave me, please. Uh, the second thing, uh, uh, it, the disaster recovery people is something, someone that is uh, able to use Open Nebula basically to restart a machine, so it's not that difficult. Uh, have two of them, give them a second phone with a, recha a rechargeable, so it always works because sometimes their phones doesn't work when there is a disaster. One operator may work on the other not, and make sure they don't go on vacation together. And actually, it happened to me as well. Uh, internally, you can use a, a, a gateway machine to provide a, a consistent IP scheme. So you don't have even to reconfigure your worms where you move them uh, away. Because remo remember that in this scheme, 
you get a remote copy of everything that's here on Open Nebula. So you cannot use uh, things like uh, the name of the host uh, or whatever, because everything is the, is the same from one side to the other. If you can, you can optimize writes, because writes are the thing that change your data store, so the things that need to be replicated uh, abroad. One thing that we uh, found that works wonder is uh, have a, a virtual machine that manages logs. Every application manages logs in a different way. If you can compress them in a single one, you can stream these writes in a single place, possibly compressed. So it's, very, it's much more efficient. Uh, this is a personal preference. I like consistency, so I really hate when you have, for example, one VM here and one there and you stream changes like in distributed MySQL or whatever, uh, because you get lots of problems when you have a copy streamed in another side. Uh, a perfect example is SQL Server that basically when you replicate the same disk and the same everything on another side, it says uh, there are two machines with the same UUID, something critical has happened, call Microsoft immediately and pay someone. Uh, and the other one is uh, try to reduce write amplification. One of the worst problems of uh, uh, replication is uh, write amplification for databases, especially MySQL, which is one of the worst in this sense. Uh, when you write uh, uh, a few kilobytes in MySQL, you end up writing several megabytes on disk. And you have to replicate all of them because we man must maintain temporal consistency. There are different data store that tend to be even faster. For example, there's a, uh, one thing that's called uh, the fractal tree, uh, which is uh, used in a, in a um, storage engine called uh, TalkUDB, that basically writes uh, one tenth the number of writes that MySQL performs for the same amount of data. Just a suggestion, uh, because it may help. Sometimes you want to have consistency, strict consistency for, for a MySQL database that is used a lot, and you want this kind of streaming things. Sometimes changing just a little bit of the interior allows you to perform it even on uh, network connectivity that is limited. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlo. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, the, the question was uh, uh, if Lizard SFS is uh, supporting Open Nebula. Actually, uh, it's much easier than that. We, uh, the, the Lizard FS uh, is uh, mounted uh, on every node and is seen as a, as a shared data store. So it's like uh, it's quite similar to how NFS, for example, is managed. So uh, we uh, changed it a little bit. Actually, we used uh, um, a, a modified uh, uh, transfer manager uh, that uh, designed it for a previous version of MooseFS. And the only thing that we changed is uh, basically that when you copy something in Open Nebula, uh, Instantiator, whatever, uh, you substitute CP with uh, uh, the equivalent uh, uh, LizardFS command for doing snapshots. Everything is done through snapshot, and so this way it's uh, basically instantaneous. So there's no need to, let's say, it's a, uh, a very small change just to support everything inside. Uh, as I said, everything runs inside of LizardFS. Uh, the on a DB, uh, all the data stores, the VMs are executed there and so on. So there's no need of a special adapter like it may be for SAP, for example, or Sheepdog. Yeah, the, the question was if the, it, it's, mm, uh, let's say, it's uh, possible to integrate a backup strategy for this. Is it uh, correct? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, the, the uh, actually, we have uh, um, a strategy specifically for this. We have a VM inside that performs b the backups on the uh, images that are inside of the data store. Um, we handle backup uh, in, uh, in a very simple way. Basically, we, s we uh, make a copy uh, in an external cold storage and we delete them as, uh, as usual. Uh, I must confess that we use a very simple, uh, I think it's Amanda as a, as a, as a VM. Uh, any 
backup appliance can be used for doing this because basically you make a snapshot to make sure that it doesn't change when, yeah? and you back uh, whatever you want to back up. Uh, the, the question is uh, how, to, how we handle, uh, how LizardFS actually handles uh, uh, the consistency issue of writes uh, and replication. Um, it is done in a very clever way. It's uh, done through uh, a versioning process in chunks. Uh, there are multiple metadata layers uh, and every modification to a chunk uh, introduces a new metadata with a specific temporal interval. Uh, so every time, for example, the first chunk that is written, that chunk is written and it does have a generation and a, a precise, uh, let's say, uh, CRC attached to it and so on. And uh, they immediately start streaming. Let's say that you lose uh, this node, so you lose the chunk and uh, you d even uh, don't have the ability to stream it to someone else because it died with everything else. At that point, when you restart it, because th this means that you have lost basically everything, when you restart, it will mm, check for consistent, it will return the metadata to the last consistent state, including the chunk that you missed, uh, removed as a transaction. So you are, uh, you are returned to the uh, instant just before that chunk got committed. Of course, that's a worst case uh, scenario, but the idea is that consistency is kept basically every time. I can uh, testify that we have situation where the customer decided to, to shut down everything many times per day and uh, basically it always recovers to a correct point in time. This means that you may lose uh, a, a transaction that you just committed, but that's basically unavoidable because it means that uh, something strikes uh, exactly in that second where a replication was started. Okay, thank you, Carlo. Let's head on to the Latin talks. You can catch up with Carlo in the break thank later, you. I guess. Thanks. <laughs>